All right, let's take our Bibles tonight, and if you will, open up with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 tonight, as we continue our series of messages called Developing a Christian Worldview. Developing a Christian Worldview. As you're turning to Genesis chapter 1, anybody else warm? Okay. Genesis chapter 1, Soren Kierkegaard... Theodore Dostovsky, Jean-Paul Sartre, and Friedrich, or Friedrich Nietzsche are all names connected to a philosophical persuasion called existentialism. I'm sure you've been studying about existentialism this past week, right? Um, existentialism. Jean-Paul Sartre gave existentialism its name, and he argued that existentialism is a logical consequence of atheists, atheism. He says, without God as a ground or source, we are left in a kind of limbo. Everything, including what it means to be a human, is left up to us. The non-existence of God is where angst comes from, and thus atheism is where existentialism begins, according to Sartre. Now, you say, uh, that's something I don't even care about. Well, I'm with you. I don't care about it either. But what that philosophy has bred in our culture today and it actually, you can trace this back many, many decades in American culture. What it has bred is a confusion about life. And so the questions that individuals come up with are things like this. Where did I come from? Who am I? You ever, you've heard that, that, especially in the 60s, you know? Who am I? You know, people were confused about who they were. Where am I going? Why am I here? How am I supposed to live? All of those are questions that, that honestly come out of this existentialism and has gotten into our culture today. And apart from God, you cannot answer those questions. But God has the answer to every single one of them. Those questions deal with the question of origin, identity, destiny, purpose, and morality. God has the question to, or the answer to every one of those questions. Man can't give those answers. Uh, I've been reminding you that as we look at this, we are looking at the difference between man's worldview versus God's worldview. And you would think, well, we're here in church tonight. Uh, boy, I am surrounded by people with God's worldview. I sure hope that's true. But according to the statistics I gave you a number of weeks ago, there are only 6% of people in a church like ours, that truly have a godly world view. And that was based off of eight fundamental questions that you and I should easily know the answers to and be able to give the answers to, but only 6% have the answers and answer correctly. That means 94% of people sitting in the church today don't have a biblical world view. And that is just unbelievable to me. It's like, how could you be in church and not have a biblical worldview? Well, I think it all goes back to what we have been looking at and dealing with how the, the foundation, the foundation of a biblical worldview has crumbled. That foundation being the book of Genesis. And people don't know this book. They don't know what this book tells you about. And it does, they don't know how that lays the foundation to everything else. And so what we are doing is taking a look at how the book of Genesis answers those questions and helps us to establish that biblical worldview. Now, we are also beginning this or coming at it from the perspective that we know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. The first foundation has got to be knowing Jesus as your Savior. That is what our life has got to be built on. But then the foundation of our beliefs, the foundation of our faith, uh, knowing these things and being able to answer the questions that are in this world. Let's tackle these tonight. First of all, where did I come from? The question of origin. Where did I come from? You know, that is a big deal to people these days. Uh, there are websites like Ancestry.com, MyHeritage.com, and people want to know what their ancestry is. There are Ancestry DNA kits that you can get. I don't know, you spit in a cup or whatever, and send it off, and they'll tell you, oh, based on your DNA, this is what you're made up of. Uh, people are reviving reunions, family reunions. That kind of lagged for a while, People are reviving those. Perhaps it's because COVID caused so much separation and people are wanting to reconnect and, and they're seeing the importance of that. I don't know what the reason is. Some people are doing it for medical reasons. 
you have medical issues and you don't know anything about your family tree, so you want to start finding out who was I related to and what were their problems. And maybe you can figure out what your problems are. There's nothing wrong with any of that kind of stuff, and if, and if that's your thing, I, I have at it. Enjoy. Me personally, I've never understood it. I really don't care what my ancestry is. It doesn't matter. I mean, some of you are going, you don't? No. I, I don't care. I mean, I know that it's German and Irish and Scottish. Okay. Whoopee. That means absolutely nothing to me. I don't care. It just doesn't matter to me. Reunions. I don't enjoy reunions. To me, it's just a lot of bother, you know? Um, And and again, some of you are going, you're kidding. I love reunions. Great. Go to mine. (laughs) Not that we have any, but uh, if we did, you can go to mine. I don't care. I'm not interested. Um, I guess the big question is, if I knew where I came from, from ancestry and all that kind of stuff, what difference would it make? I mean, how would it make a difference to how I live my life today? I doubt seriously there is a gazillionaire out there that has me in their will. And I'm pretty sure that there's nobody in in Scotland or Ireland or wherever that is getting ready to abdicate the throne, and I'm the next heir. So if I find out that I've got all these people I'm related to, what difference did it make? Quite honestly, none. It didn't make a lick of difference. But let's remind us of something that we saw last week that does make a difference. In Genesis 1, 26, God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the uh, cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Go to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5, the first two verses. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Let's go to the book of Ephesians and look at Ephesians chapter 2. And just kind of put a marker here because we're going to come back to this passage. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 10. Just the first part of verse 10 and what it tells us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. The Bible says, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. If I know this is my origin, does that make a difference? My origin is that I was created by God. My origin takes me back to the original father and mother of every single one of us, Adam and Eve. My origin takes me back to their sin and the results of that sin, and specifically Adam, because through Adam passed the sin nature down to us. That's my origin. That's your origin. That's the origin that matters. Existentialism leads to intellectual atheism. And if that's where we derive our answer for our origin and we say that there is no God, listen to the natural result of this. This is from a fellow by the name of Dr. Richard E. Simmons III. Not that Richard Simmons. And it says... If, if we believe in existentialism and there is no God, then we are here by chance. We are nothing but a mass of molecules. A human life has no real value, for we are nothing but the product of nature. Since we are just physical beings, we have no souls or any spiritual dimension to our lives. We are meaningless beings in this random universe." If we do not understand our origins, we talked last week about procreation and the sanctity of life. Life has no sanctity if I don't know my origin. If I am just here by chance, if I'm just a pile of molecules, if I am the product of nature, if I have no soul, if I'm an animal or the product of an animal, that's where it all leads to, doesn't it? Knowing our origin. Who am I? (laughs) 
This tells me exactly who I am, or actually, uh, where did I come from? It tells me my origin, where I came from. You know tonight where you came from, don't you? God made you. The second question, who am I? The question of identity. Do we know who we are? How would you answer that? Who am I? A lot of times we say, well, I'm a factory worker. I'm a, uh, I work in a store. I do this. I do that. I didn't ask what you did. Who are you? Who am I? What's your identity? You know, identity theft is a big deal in America, right? And people lose their identity all the time. 15 million Americans every year become victims of identity theft. That is one out of every three. In 2021, the Federal Trade Commission handled 1.4 million fraud reports that resulted in $1.48 billion in losses. And over 1 million children had their identity stolen at the cost of $2.67 billion. What is our identity? Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. If we have our origins figured out, then this answer follows a natural progression. In chapter 2, in verse 7, Who am I? This tells me who I am. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, origin, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's my identity. Go to chapter 9. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. In chapter 9 of Genesis, verses 1 through 6, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, and to your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by him, by man, shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. In chapter 2 and verse 7, the Bible says that we are a living soul when the Lord breathed the breath of life into our nostrils. Now, that phrase, living soul is a phrase that is used two other times. It's used in chapter 1, verse 21, chapter 1 and verse 24 of Genesis. Both times it's translated living creature because it's applied to the animals. How is that different from you and I? The Bible tells us that you and I had the breath of God blown into our nostrils, making us a living soul, making us of a different kind than the animals. The Bible clearly teaches that you and I can eat the animals, right? Now, I know that that upsets the PETA people and the ASPCA people, and uh, they say, well, you're murdering the animal. No, you're not. You murder people. You kill the animal. You say, what's the difference? God told us, kill and eat. Amen. Hallelujah to that. Kill and eat that. Why? You say, well, that's a living soul. You're going to murder that living soul. It doesn't have the breath of God in its nostrils. God definitely made it. It is definitely a living creature. The Bible says that the life is in the blood. Don't eat the blood. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to? And he says, don't do that, but you can eat the meat. So you kill the animal, you drain the blood, you cook it up. And you have yourself a steak, you have yourself a burger, you have yourself whatever. God says that's doable. Why? Because it's not a person. It is not a human being. And like I said last week, it is high time that Christians, I expect the nonsense out of the world, but Christians need to get their emotions out of the equation and read their Bible. The Bible makes a huge difference, folks, between people and pets. And your pet is not another person in your family. You want me to prove it? You're doing your taxes, right? Try to claim them. Just try it. You can't. You know why? Well, the government knows they're not a people. You know they're not a people either. You say, oh, but I love my little, my little doggy. I love my little cat. I don't understand that, but you know. Okay. So snuggle with your little pet and rub noses with it and let it lick your face and whatever you do that makes you happy. 
But that's not a person. And that's not who we are. Our identity. We are a living soul that started out with the breath of God breathed into our nostrils. So that leads us to the next point. Why am I here? The question of purpose. Let's turn to Psalm chapter 33. Why am I here? The question of purpose. When you think about this, um, this is a little bit more complicated, if you will, to answer simply for the fact that when you think about it, omniscient God knew everything that was going to happen. So why did omniscient God go ahead and create Adam and Eve knowing what they were going to do? Why didn't he just scrap that plan? Why didn't he just say, no, I'm not going to make them? Because their creation is what brought Jesus Christ to Calvary's cross. And I know that the Bible tells us that before the foundation of the world, Christ was heading to the cross because God already knew what they were going to do. But why make them in the first place then? So our purpose, why am I here? In Psalm chapter 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. This establishes what we have been seeing in in our Wednesday night as well as the Sunday night series, that God spoke this world into existence. It, It wasn't something that happened over an evolutionary billions of years. God spoke it into existence. It's interesting, and I don't understand how in the world the theistic evolutionists ever come up with their their nonsensical answer or their explanation because God taught us even how to tell time. You go right into the book of Genesis chapter 1, God taught us how to tell time, and we're still telling time today the exact same way as time was told then in the creation of this world. The evening and the morning was day one. Evening and morning was day two. Evening and morning was day three. Isn't that how we tell time? We put it into a 24-hour compacted set of hours. And this is how God created this earth. Now, uh, Dr. Terry Mortensen in the book Searching for Adam writes this. He said, To postulate millions of years between these supernatural acts of creation is an insult to the wisdom of God. Why would God create the earth and leave it covered with water for millions of years? It just doesn't make sense, does it? But God created this earth. He commanded it. He said, let it be, and it was done. Look at the next one. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 45. In Isaiah chapter 45, God created this earth with a purpose. In Isaiah 45 and verse 18, it tells us what that purpose is. Isaiah 45 verse 18, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens... God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it, what was the purpose? To be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. God created this earth by the spoken word, he commanded it into place, he said, let it be, and it was because he wanted a place that would be inhabited. Why? Why is that so important? Let's go back to Psalm chapter 19. Psalm chapter 19. Now, when you read the book of Job, um, and you read after those three friends, so-called, of Job's came in and and chewed him up one side and down the other, the fourth friend comes in and chews on Job and chews on the three friends, and when God speaks, and this is interesting because God says nothing negative about that fourth friend. It's only the three that shot their mouth off at Job and said all the wrong things. God says nothing about that fourth friend. Why? Because the fourth friend was right. And when God starts to speak, he essentially says to Job, Job, where were you when I did this and this and this and this and this? Tell me, Job, where were you when this happened? Why did God do all of this. Psalm chapter 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. 
Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You have to declare the glory of God to someone. You say, well, then God could have declared it to the animals, right? No. You declare it to that which was made in your image. And the animals were not made in the image of God. People were. And we were made to inhabit this planet so that God could display His glory to somebody. And you see, God didn't create us as a bunch of robots. He created us with a free will so that we would go out into that creation that He made. And we have to make a choice. Am I going to glorify God? Am I going to give Him the glory that He rightfully deserves? And who better to demonstrate His glory to than to those who have fallen so far short of the glory of God. Now, we can take this a step further. Why am I here? What's my purpose? In Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and they were created. For Thy pleasure, for Your purpose. Romans 11.36, For of Him... And through Him and to Him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Colossians 1.16, For by Him were all things created that are in the heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Everything was created by God for His purpose. But what what was His ultimate purpose? Go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What is our purpose? You know, Christians, we can take this even a step further. You have your marker back here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. The Bible says that we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Why were we saved? We were saved out of God's great love for us. It was a merciful act whereby God provided the gift of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. And once we are saved, we now take on a whole brand new purpose in life. We now have good works that we are supposed to be involved in, those of us created in Christ Jesus. The Bible talks about we are to know Him and the power of His resurrection. We are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Many other things could be added. Christian, you and I have purpose, God-given purpose. We were made for a purpose. There should be no confusion in our life about who we are, why we're here, and what we're supposed to do, what our purpose is in life. A couple weeks ago in the Sunday morning message, I had talked about the nonsense that has infiltrated the church for the last uh, 50-some years about this whole self-esteem garbage that is taught, and the, the, the nonsense of it. Absolute nonsense. If people will go to their Bible, they will see what their purpose is in life, and they will recognize that God did not create us for no good reason. He created us for purpose. Now, let's consider how I should live. How should I live? Let's go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Morality is defined by acknowledging that there is a divine designer who created us in His image and holds the universe accountable to His standard. If you believe in evolution, you believe that you are here by chance, you are here by um, the random joining of molecules or whatever, and it eventually became you. You went, and we talked last week about jumping kinds. You went from the amoeba. You jumped from that kind to amphibian. You jumped from that kind to um, mammalian. You jumped from that kind to being an ape. You jumped from that kind to being a person. If that is a person's philosophy, 
then they have no sense of morality. Every once in a while at, at nights, and there's certain times of the year that it's worse than others, but we'll be in the house, you can have the television on, and all of a sudden you can watch the dog's ears just go like two big radar, just and then starts barking like crazy. And you start listening. You know what you hear outside? And it's like, oh boy, cat fight, getting ready to happen. And so you go outside, and, hey, knock it off. And off they go. Man, just a fight in the whole way. Animalistic behavior. Why are they behaving like animals? Because they are animals. It's that simple. They have no sense of morality. Man, these lousy cats, they hook up nightly. I mean, they, I'm not being crass. It's just they have no morality. Why? Because they're an animal. We're, we're, are, we are God's creation, created in the image of God. Therefore, our morality requires us to give an account to our designer. Genesis chapter 2, it starts out early. In Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden and to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. One rule. I mean, how many laws are on the books in the state of Ohio that we have to follow? How many laws or, or rules do you have at work that you have to follow? When man is formed and placed in the garden, one rule and that's it. Everything else was free, have at it. One rule and he couldn't keep that. Go to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis 3 verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee not that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. The Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. You know, when you read that, can you imagine? what it must have been like for Adam and Eve to experience fear for the very first time. Up until this point, they'd never been afraid. They never even knew the emotion. It wasn't in them. But the moment that they took of that fruit, their eyes were open, and fear got a hold of them. The first thing you read about, fear. And then they recognized they were naked. And so they make themselves these clothes, and then they hide. They hide from God, and as soon as they decide to respond to God, they can't hardly wait to throw the next person under the bus. Adam, it's her fault. Eve, well, it's the serpent's fault. You know, just throw them right under the bus. Do you realize why they're doing this? It's because internally there is a sense of morality that's there. You don't read about an animal going, oh, my, things have changed for me. I wonder what I should do next. I think I'll eat these people. And will I feel bad about that? Oh, absolutely not. Why? Because I'm an animal. You know, can you, can you imagine? They go from one day being able to play with the lions and tigers and bears, oh my, to running from them, afraid. Everything's changed. Morality comes into play. If you teach evolution, you have removed God and morality from the equation, and you have set up an immoral society. A fellow by the name of Richard Dawkins, 
He is an evolutionary spokesperson. He made it clear that there is no basis for morality and evolution. And he said, all I can say is, that's just tough. We have to face up to the truth. A fellow by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer, remember that name? Serial killer, sexual predator. He said, if a person doesn't think that there is a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep it within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from the slime. When we, when we died, you know, that was it. There's nothing. And that was his view. That's where evolution took him. Sir Arthur Keith, a British anthropologist, he was an atheistic evolutionist, and even though he was an anti-Nazi, he recognized that the fewer was an evolutionist. And he said this of the fewer. He said of Hitler, he says, as I have consistently maintained, the fewer is an evolutionist. He has consciously sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. I don't think anybody would call Hitler a moral individual. Maybe Whoopi Goldberg. That's another subject. Disgusting one. He was an immoral individual as he exterminated all those Jewish people, as he sought to, to create the super race, the perfect race. That's called evolution. That's where evolution takes you. It takes you to a place of immorality. Look at our world where we're at today. Why is this world as immoral as it is? You say, well, because the Bible says evil men will wax worse and worse. Absolutely right. But you also can trace it to certain things. If you keep telling the kids in the school system that they have evolved from, from slime, that they have evolved from an, an ape, you keep telling them that they are animalistic, you have taken away their need to answer to God. And you have made them an immoral individual. Those immoral kids become immoral teenagers who become immoral adults, who become the leaders of our town, our city, our state, our nation. The heads in your job, your factories, your companies. Individuals who believe that you came from goo, that you came from a chimp, are individuals that are not going to possess the God-given sense of morality that would cause them to act appropriately. No wonder they're confused about who they are. You cannot dismiss God, disavow God, and be able to figure out who you are. Here's the final thing. Go back to Genesis 3, verse 15. The final question, where am I going? And this is the purpose of destiny. The Bible says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is called the Proto-Evangelium, the first mention of the gospel. The bruising of Jesus' heel versus the uh, bruising of Satan's head, the fatal blow that would be dealt to Satan. Charles Spurgeon said, this is the first gospel sermon that was ever delivered upon the surface of the earth. It was a more memorable discourse indeed, with Jehovah himself for the preacher and the whole human race and the prince of darkness for the audience. There is a gospel message because there are two destinies possible for every human being. Now, again, you go back to what Jeffrey Dahmer said in the evolutionist belief, there is no God, so there is no final destiny. We just poof out of existence. We die, that's it. We're done. Because we're not going to go and meet our maker. You know, there used to be a time where that was a pretty popular phrase, you know, prepare to meet your maker. Now people are saying, well, what's my maker? Is it evolution? Is it chance? Is it Big Bang? Is it what is my maker? I don't know what my maker is, so I have no real genuine purpose. And I'm not real sure who I am. I'm not real sure how to live morally. I'm not real sure where I'm going because God's been removed from the equation. Perhaps that's one of the reasons behind why evolution and why the crumbling of a biblical worldview in this country is happening. Because people don't want to face the fact that one day, everybody answers to God. One day. 
Every lost person will stand before God one day. Every saved person will stand before God one day. Every Christian stands at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. It's a place of reward. It's not a place of dealing with our salvation that's been taken care of in the blood of Jesus. It's not a place dealing with our sin that was taken care of at Calvary. It's a place of reward and loss of reward. Every lost soul, they will be at the great white throne judgment. There is one verdict that is there, and it's a depart from me, I never knew you verdict. And death and hell, the Bible says, are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There are two destinies, and every single one of us here this evening, right at this very second, we are headed to one destiny or the other. There is no third destiny. Oh, I know some have the teaching of purgatory. That's the place where you're going to go to figure out which way you're going. i got news for you. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches anything about purgatory. It's heaven or hell. And it's this side of eternity that the decision needs to be made. And there is only one way into heaven, and there is only one way into hell. There are not multiple ways. And it all has to do with what you did with Jesus. You either accepted Him or you rejected Him. There is no in-between answer. Where am I going? The first four questions that we've asked tonight are questions that we can answer, that I can answer for you. I can't answer this last question for you. I can only answer it for me. I know where my destiny is going to be. I know that when I leave this world, I'm in heaven. Not because I'm a pastor, not because I'm a Baptist, not because I'm a good person. I'll be in heaven because of what Jesus Christ did for me when He saved my soul. That's where I'll be for eternity, with Christ, with my Savior, with my God, with my Maker. Where will you be? One split second after you die, where will you be? What's your destiny? I can tell you what Jesus wants for you. We've already read the verse that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what God wants for you. But He is not going to force His salvation on you. You have to personally call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. You have to personally repent and believe the gospel. Would this be the night that you'd do that? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, these questions that have puzzled humanity, these existentialists that never could find the answer, the reason they couldn't find the answer is because they looked for those answers apart from you. But God, I thank you that you have the answers. And I thank you tonight, Lord, that every one of us that are here this evening, we can know beyond any shadow of a doubt where our final destiny will be. And if there's one here this evening that isn't sure, or they know for sure they're not saved, then I pray, Lord, that tonight that they'd give their heart and their life to you. As believers, these questions that we answer, maybe we've never quite thought of them like this. And perhaps it's an encouragement to us and we realize you know, a greater capacity of why you made us. And maybe there's something you're laying on our heart tonight that you want us to do for you, and this needs to be a night of surrender, a night where we would allow you to do the work in our heart that's necessary. Lord, the invitation time, it's yours, it's not ours. It's just our time to do business with you. And so, Lord, may you have the freedom to work in each of our lives, for we pray and ask in Jesus' name.